Chapter 36 of American History Stories, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. American History Stories, Volume 2, by Mara L. Pratt. Chapter 36, Saratoga. There was another terrible battle this time at Saratoga, in which General Gates succeeded in so breaking up Burgoyne's army that this proud British general was obliged to surrender. Both generals had fought bravely and skilfully, and although they were enemies in battle, they respected each other as men. And when, after the surrender, Burgoyne gave up his sword to Gates, he did so very courteously, saying, The fortunes of war, General Gates, have made me your prisoner. General Gates, taking the sword, said with equal politeness, I shall always be glad to testify, General Burgoyne, that it was through no fault of yours that it happened so. I am afraid the newspapers again printed many jokes about the defeated Burgoyne, as they recalled the extravagant threats he had made at the beginning of his campaign. His people, too, in England, blamed him severely, which I think was rather unjust. For, in spite of all, he was a brave and skilful soldier, the only trouble was that he was on the wrong side of the truth, and the wrong side seldom succeeds in any battle. End of chapter 36 Chapter 37 of American History Stories, Volume 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. American History Stories, Volume 2 By Mara L. Pratt Chapter 37 The Half-Witted Tory Boy at the very beginning, Burgoyne was upset in his plans by a half-witted boy. To be sure, this was no credit to the boy, nor was it any discredit to Burgoyne. Still, in the latter days of the war, when Burgoyne had been conquered by the Americans, and had been made to surrender, the colonists liked now and then to recall this little story as a joke. St. Ledger had been sent by Burgoyne to take a certain fort— Knowing this, Arnold was sent by the American general to hold the same fort against the attack. How the battle might have ended, had Arnold and St. Ledger met, we cannot tell. But as the story goes, this is the way Arnold won the fort. He had with him a prisoner of a half-witted boy. He had been taken from some Tory family, very likely, for he would not, or could not, understand that he was in the hands of the Whigs, and so would keep saying, over and over, in his foolish way, I, Tory, I, Tory. As the little fellow was homesick and miserable, Arnold was struck with the idea that perhaps he could make some use of him by offering him his freedom. So calling him to him, he said, My young lad, would you like to go home? The poor little fellow jumped about and uttered some strange sounds that meant to express his joy at the thought. Then Arnold explained to him that if he would go to the camp of St. Ledger, and tell him that a great, big army of Americans was coming to attack him, he should be given his liberty. The boy understood, and away he went. He cut his clothes full of round holes to represent bullet holes, and rushed breathless into St. Ledger's camp. "'What is it, boy? Where are you from? Who are you?' asked the British soldiers, frightened at his appearance. I cannot tell you how he did it, but he managed to make St. Ledger believe that a terrible army was bearing down upon him, and that he had better escape while he could. When St. Ledger asked him how many there were, he pointed to the leaves up the trees, as if to say no one could count them. The result was that St. Ledger and his men took to flight, not even taking time to take down their tents or pack their supplies. They say, all things are fair in war. If so, I suppose this must have been fair. How does it seem to you, little boys and little girls? You will have to talk this over with your teacher, I think. End of chapter 37 Chapter 38 of American History Stories, Volume 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. American History Stories, Volume 2, by Mara L. Pratt, Chapter 38, The Fox of the Southern Swamp There was one brave patriot working away in the swampy country in South Carolina. This man was General Marion, and so wise was he, and so brave, 
and succeeded in stealing such marches upon the enemies in this southern district, that he was called the Fox of the Southern Swamp. I shall not try to tell you of the successful raids he made, and the successful battles he fought, because battles all sound pretty much alike to little folks, and you might grow tired of hearing them. If I can tell you of some of the stories of those times, which will help you to understand the kind of men and women these patriots were, how brave they were, and how much they were willing to suffer for the cause which seemed to them right, I know your teacher will be better satisfied than she would be to hear you repeat like parrots the names and dates of all the battles in our whole history. This General Marion had a camp in a swamp among the forests and tangled grasses and mosses, a place so hidden and so hard to enter that no one cared to attempt an attack upon him. From this place Marion and his men used to march forth to battle. At one time a British officer was brought into this camp to talk with Marion about some prisoners. After they had arranged matters, Marion invited the young officer to dine with him. The officer accepted, but when he was taken to the mess-room, and saw only a pine-log for a table, on which were heaped nothing but baked potatoes, he asked in astonishment, "'Is this all you have for dinner?' "'This is all,' answered General Marion, "'and we thought ourselves fortunate in having more potatoes than usual, when we had a visitor to dine with us.' "'You must have good pay to make up for such living,' said the officer. "'On the contrary,' answered Marion, "'I have never received a dollar.' nor has one of my men. What on earth are you fighting for? For the love of liberty, answered the hero. The story says that the young officer went back to Charleston, and resigned his position in the English army, saying he would not fight against men who fought from such motives, and were willing to endure such hardships. End of chapter 38 Chapter 39 of American History Stories, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. American History Stories, Volume 2, by Mara L. Pratt. Chapter 39. Song of Marion's Men. Our band is few, but true and tried, our leader frank and bold. The British soldier trembles when Marion's name is told. Our fortress is the good greenwood, our tent the cypress tree. We know the forest round us, as seamen know the sea. We know its walls of thorny vines, its glades of reedy grass, its safe and silent islands within the dark morass. Woe to the English soldiery that little dread us near! On them shall light at midnight a strange and sudden fear. When waking to their tents on fire, they grasp their arms in vain, and they who stand to face us are beat to earth again. And they who fly in terror deem a mighty host behind, And hear the tramp of thousands upon the hollow wind. Then sweet the hour that brings release from danger and from toil. We talk the battle over, and share the battle's spoil. The woodland rings with laugh and shout, as if a hunt were up, And woodland flowers were gathered to crown the soldier's cup. With merry songs we mock the wind that in the pintop grieves, And slumbers sound and sweetly on beds of oaken leaves. Well knows the fair and friendly moon, the band that Marion leads, The glitter of their rifles, the scampering of their seeds. Tis life to guide the fiery barb across the moonlit plain, Tis life to feel the night wind that lifts his tossing mane. A moment in the British camp, a moment and away, Back to the pathless forest, before the peep of day. Grave men they are by broad Santee, Grave men with hoary hairs. Their hearts are all with Marion, For Marion are their prayers. And lovely ladies greet our band, With kindest welcoming, With smiles like those of summer, And tears like those of spring. For them we wear these rusty arms, And lay them down no more till we have driven the Britons for ever from our shore. Bryant End of chapter 39 Chapter 40 of American History Stories, Volume 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. American History Stories, Volume 2 by Mara L. Pratt 
Chapter 40 The Women of South Carolina The women of South Carolina were not one step behind the men in bravery and patriotic spirit. In a certain battle at Cowpens, not a very romantic name, a certain General Tarleton was totally defeated by an American officer, Colonel Washington. General Tarleton, who was, I think, not much of a gentleman, used to seize every opportunity to sneer at Colonel William Washington, whenever a certain patriotic woman, a great admirer of the brave young Washington, was present. Now as Tarleton bore a wound which young Washington had given him, and had, moreover, been chased like a puppy from the battlefield, one would think that Tarleton's good taste would have prevented him from saying much about it. But Tarleton had not very exquisite taste, I think. "'I should like to see this young friend of yours,' said Tarleton one day to this lady. "'I hear he is a very common, mean-looking man.' "'If you had taken time to look behind you at Cowpens, General Tarleton, you would have been sure to see him,' returned the lady quickly. One would suppose, after this sharp reply, that General Tarleton would have said no more against Colonel Washington. But only a few days later, at a large dinner, at which this same lady was present, General Tarleton again said, "'I understand that this young Washington is a very ignorant man. I am told that he cannot even write his name.' "'Possibly he cannot,' said the lady, quick-witted as before. "'But,' continued she, pointing to General Tarleton's wounded arm, "'he can make his mark, as you yourself can testify.' Another story is told of a South Carolina woman who had seven sons in the patriotic army. One day a British general stopped at her house, and tried to show her how much better it would be for her sons if they would only join the British army. "'Join the British army!' cried she. "'Sooner than see one of my boys turn against his own country, would I go, this baby in my arms, and enlist under Marion's banner.' and show my sons how to fight, and, if need be, die for the freedom of this land of ours. And these brave women of South Carolina not only encouraged their husbands and sons by brave words, but often acted the part of messengers in expeditions of trust and secrecy. Two brave women, whose husbands were in the army, disguised themselves in the dress of men, and captured two British soldiers compelled them to give up the messages they were carrying, and bore them to General Green, whose camp was not far distant. End of chapter 40